Hey, today I want to talk to you about abusive relationships. A lot of people, a lot of us have suffered from abuse. And so how do we cope with that? How do we get beyond it? How do we move beyond it and live a happy, successful life? Hey, I'm Mitch at Keeping the Vows and uh, where we're all about helping people to discover and maintain a Christ-like marriage. Thanks so much for tuning in. We do questions and answers here, and it's really good because it keeps us relevant with what's going on. So I'd like to read the question that came to us today. It says this, uh, Abusive relationships. As someone who has survived an abusive relationship prior to my marriage with the love of my life, my heart goes out to all people out there who are in relationships plagued by abuse. It is so easy to spot an abusive relationship after you have been in one yourself, but so difficult to self-diagnose in many cases, especially if you've not been in one before. They tend to start out as relatively normal, happy relationships, and the slow creep of abuse starts with small, seemingly forgivable abuses that disguise themselves as controlling tendencies. Over time, these small abuses pile up until one day you realize one or both of you are abusers. Hey, there's two questions here, and let's outline those, okay? The first one is, um, what hope do people in these types of relationships have when one of the parties is the clear abuser and the victim is afraid to broach the topic with the abuser for fear of retaliation instead of them trying to understand how the victim is feeling? And the second question, what is the best course of action for these victims of physical and mental abuse? Two great questions, and I'm going to try and answer them here. Please understand, I'm not going to handle everything I know about abuse in a short little video like this, but we'll do the best to summarize this, okay? Uh, first of all, I want to tell people, if you've been abused, and I have been, abuse is not your fault. Uh, get over it. Abuse is not your fault. You didn't do anything to earn your abuse, okay? Getting hit, sexually assaulted, verbally abused uh, is not your fault. Abuse can come in many forms, but it's always wrong. The abuser will often try to make you believe that you deserve it somehow. There's something you did that you deserve that abuse. But, you know, they think that they're strong, but they're actually just weak in doing that because you don't deserve abuse. No one deserves it. This is just a way for them to rationalize what it is that they're doing. No one deserves to be abused. All right? Secondly, hurting people hurt people. Uh, when someone hurts me, someone says something nasty or sharp or cuts me off, as a counselor, the first thing I think is, gee, I wonder what it is in their life that is causing them to be so hurtful. Because hurting people hurt people. Kind, healthy people are kind and healthy to other people. So it doesn't take away the abuse that the hurting person is hurting you, but it makes you understand that they're hurting you because there's something wrong inside of them too. Once again, it does not make it right that they're doing that. It just makes you understand that there's something wrong that's causing them to be that way. Something to think about. So let's talk about question number one. What hope do people in these types of relationships have when one of the parties is the clear abuser and the victim is afraid to broach the topic with the abuser for fear of retaliation instead of them trying to understand how the victim is feeling? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, of course, if your spouse is willing to go to counseling, that's the most important thing. And go to a Christian counselor. Um, a secular counselor doesn't understand the Christian realm. I had a counseling professor who also had a counseling business at the same time. And he would have a secular counselor call him up and say, I've got some clients that came to me and they need God talk. And he would send them to this Christian counselor, which was a great thing to do. At least he knew that he couldn't handle it because he didn't understand how to apply godly principles along with his counseling principles. So remember, as you go for counseling, that you're going to need to learn to forgive. And you say, well, I don't want to forgive them because I'm setting them free. That's not true. I have another talk I'm going to do here shortly on forgiveness, all about what forgiveness is and what forgiveness isn't. Forgiveness is not for the person who abused you. Forgiveness is for you. It sets you free. Not forgiving someone is like me taking rat poison and then expecting the other person to die. Forgiveness is what we do in our own heart, and it's what God tells us to do. It's not setting them free of what they did. It's not saying con you're condoning it, that what they did was okay. But forgiveness is just what we're supposed to do as Christians. It's the hallmark of being a Christian. If we're forgiven of our sins, which we are through Jesus Christ, once we accept that gift of salvation, then we need to forgive others. Leave it up to God. God can handle it better than I can anyway. Also, the other thing, too, is a lot of times, you know, we harbor unforgiveness for people, and we, we're carrying that inside. It's stewing, it's brewing up inside of us, it's boiling inside of us, and they don't even know about it anymore. So it's eating us up, but it's not even bothering them. So forgiveness is for us, not for the other person. So if you would, go to a counselor. Now, I know a lot of times people will say, go to a counselor. But yeah, but my spouse won't go to the counselor. The abuser won't go to the counselor. Very, very common. Okay. 
And a lot of times they'll say, well, there's nothing wrong with me. You're the one that needs counseling. You can go if you want to. I've heard that a lot. But if your spouse won't go for counseling, it doesn't mean that, that you have to live with the abuse. Uh, first of all, you can go for counseling and you can get help and work on yourself. And that's important, okay? I want to talk about three different kinds of abuse here, just three basic kinds. The first is physical. Nobody should have to live in a relationship with physical abuse. Uh, I hear people say the only justifiable reason for divorce is adultery, and we'll talk more about that in a little bit. And I can't recommend somebody stay in a relationship where their well-being is threatened, whether it's just from being beaten up or being killed. I can't, I can't recommend somebody to stay in a relationship like that. And once again, we'll touch on that a little bit more. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about is emotional abuse. And emotional abuse is every bit as painful as physical abuse, and maybe even more so. So being, having your emotions attacked and being told that you're, you're not worthy, you're unworthy, is, is hard, especially when it comes from the one who vowed to God to love and honor and cherish you for the rest of their life. The next abuse is sexual abuse, and they're going to divide this up into a couple different types. The one is sex outside of marriage. In this day, if, if you're married and your spouse is having sex with all the STDs out there, that could be a life sentence. I don't have a lot of leeway for that. I had a lady come to me. She'd been married two years, and her husband had had seven affairs that she knew of, but she didn't think she should leave him because she was supposed to be forgiving. And she wouldn't hear me, and you know, I, I, I kept t trying to tell her things that she should consider, and she just was oblivious to it. Finally, I asked her a question. Don't think I'm like this all the time, but you know, she wouldn't listen at all. So finally, I said, can I ask you a question? And she said, yes. And I said, do you have the word gullible tattooed somewhere on your body? And it was enough to snap her into reality, and she realized she wasn't being relevant. Seven times in two years, you just gotten married. Seven times in two years, he's had an affair, and you won't even consider separating from him, you know, or something like that, you know, for, to, to get started down the road. So something to think about. Um, also, sexual abuse in the marriage. It can happen. Sexual abuse within the marriage, too, can happen. A woman's body is very, very precious to her. And uh, a man needs to honor that, and a man needs to uh, understand that. A woman will give her body when everything is aligned right, when she feels honored and valued and loved and cherished, and that she feels that she's appealing. And men, if you're tearing down her self-worth, she's not going to do that. And if you tell her she's, she's all these horrible things and want to have sex with her, she feels absolutely horrible about having sex with you. And my goal is that when, when Kim gives herself to me, I want it to be because she really wants to because it's the way that I treat her. It's the way that I love her. It's the way that I deal with her every single day. Okay? But men don't understand this often. Okay? So sex outside the marriage, abuse in the marriage, and then sexual abuse before the marriage too. If you have been raped or abused sexually... Before you get married, I would recommend definitely that you tell your spouse, your fiance about it, okay? And go get counseling. Make sure that you're relieved of all that. That's out of your mind, okay? Um, make sure that you, you've dealt with it. Make sure that you're healthy. Let me explain. If somebody has sexually abused you and now you think sex is dirty and you're ashamed of it, but you get married, you could think sex is dirty and be ashamed of it throughout your marriage. So your husband or your wife, whichever, will actually be paying the price for what that person did to you for the rest of your, their lives. And that's not fair. So you need to go and get that unlocked, get the unforgiveness, and, and make sure that everything is okay so that you are, are healthy sexually and you're healthy sexually for your spouse. Make sure that you do that. Okay, question number two. What's the best course of action for these victims of physical and mental abuse? Of course, the ideal situation is the two of you could go to good Christian counseling, but oftentimes that won't happen. I'm going to tackle a question now that a lot of you might be wondering in the background, but you're afraid to ask, okay? And the Bible says that the only real grounds for divorce is unfaithfulness in a marriage. And a lot of people say that's rigid, that's all there is to it, and uh, can I divorce someone if it's something else? If someone's beating me and I think he's going to kill me, can I divorce them? Or no, because he's not sexually unfaithful, I can't? I'd like to talk to you now about what to do when things are going wrong and your spouse won't listen. The best thing that I know of is a trial separation. And hopefully a trial separation is something that will bring them back to attention. So they're not, they're not living with you anymore. They're not sleeping with you anymore. They're not interacting with you anymore. And hopefully that's enough to jolt them to where they will go for counseling or something like that. If you do a trial separation, you got to make sure that you have the guts to stick with it. Because oftentimes someone who's an abuser is married to someone who is an enabler. And you're someone that lets them get by with it. So if you say, okay, we're going to get separated and this, 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 and you set up the ground rules, but they don't, they don't comply by the rules and you let them come back, then you need counseling as much as the abuser for 
the fact that, you know, you're an enabler. So make sure that if you do tell someone, hey, we're going to get try to do a trial separation, make sure you stick to it. And in doing that, hopefully they'll long for you enough that they'll be willing to change. So what if he says, I, I got you where I want you, and you're going to be in this forever. I'm never going to let you out of this marriage, okay? Then we talked about this a lot in our, in our classes and counseling and things like that. I just want to throw an idea past you and just see what you think of it, okay? So what do you do if your spouse will not reconcile, but they will not divorce? This is what we call a sticky wicket. This is a tough situation. It means there's no quick fix. It's easy to say there's only divorce for marital unfaithfulness, but what do we do when the woman fears for her life or the person is abusive and just won't change? This is what one of my professors said. He said that if you're separated and nothing changes and nothing changes and nothing changes, this is what he tells the client, the person who's abused. I know you don't believe in divorce for trivial matters and neither do I. In this case, you might file for divorce and tell your spouse this, quote, I don't believe in divorce, but because of the choices that you have made and that you continue to make, Based on your decisions, you have left me no choice but to file for divorce. Now, I know there's people that are going to say, no, the Bible says the only reason for divorce is marital unfaithfulness, and, and that's fine. But I also can't leave a person in a position where their, their self-esteem is constantly being shredded every day by someone, or they're in fear for their life, or they're being even sexually abused, raped within their own marriage. I can't do that. So that's just a thought. What would happen if they do that? I've never come to that point where I've actually had to do that yet. Usually I actually recommend that people get separated and after a couple months of separation when the person who's the abuser realizes that the victim isn't going to change and lower their standards and say you have to get help or else, then they usually just file for divorce and it's over, Okay, which takes the, the guilt of the filing for divorce off the, the person who was abused. I know this might not be popular to some, but I've given it a lot of thought, a lot of prayer, and uh, talked with other people, other pastors and other counselors, and it just might be a reasonable way to go. You know, when you get abused, you need to go and get help. You need to unlock the, the feelings of worthlessness. And it's so, so important to do that. God made you. You are absolutely wonderful. You are unique, and you are wonderful. And so you need to understand that. If you're walking around thinking less than that, please, by all means, go see a good Christian counselor. Hey, thanks for watching this today. I hope it's been helpful. Uh, check out our blog at keepingthevows.com or other YouTube videos. Appreciate if you do that. Please leave a comment uh, if you would. Hit the like button if you would or subscribe. We'd appreciate that. And uh, uh, have a great day. God bless.